is he with blinding robe? Who is he who stands before the great I am? Who is he who takes the scroll? Who is he who claims the throne? Who is he whose blood has paid the price for me?
musicians come at this time and he's going to open us in prayer may we pray our heavenly father we feel the spirit of the lord in this place we thank you for the beautiful choir arrangement lord how it lifts our hearts in praise and worship to thee we know that your holy spirit is with us and we rejoice and we're glad that we're in the house of the Lord today. I pray that you bless every song that's sung, everything that's done, and as the message goes forth today, that you would bless our pastor. We thank you for his strength, the Lord, as he preaches to us. And may we be receptive for those things that you have for us. We would not forget to pray for those that are sick of our number today, that in accordance with your will, Lord, you would have your hand of mercy and healing upon them. Bring us, Lord, together in this worship in a spirit of unity as only your spirit can do. For we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And all God's people said, amen. Let's stand over the audience. Start with some great songs of the faith and choir. Yes, that was a blessing. Glad to hear y'all sing from your hearts. Let's sing all hail the power of Jesus name and let's lift it up this morning. wonderful this morning continue to stand we always make this second song our fellowship song if you're viewing over the live stream please let us know that you're watching this morning also greet our visitors wave smile and then if you have your tithes and offerings turn them in at the stations near each exit door so thank you again for your faithfulness today let's lift up this great song of the faith come christians join to sing i yeah. 
right, that looks lots better. Sing the second. Come, lift your hearts on high. Hallelujah, amen. Let praises fill the sky. Hallelujah, amen. He is our guide and friend. To us he'll condescend. His love shall never end. Hallelujah, amen. Praise yet our Christ again. Alleluia, amen. Life shall not end the strain. Alleluia, amen. On heaven's blissful shore, his goodness will adore. Please be seated. Again, it's so good to see you out this morning. Um, I was lo I always look at my weather app, and we've got VBS this week, and this is going to be the hottest week of the year. So, <laughs> in more ways than one. Um, but uh, but do pray for our vacation Bible school. We don't usually put balloons and streamers in our auditorium. Just thought I would tell you that in case you were wondering. Um, we do not usually do that, but we do have it decorated a little bit for our. VBS tonight, and uh, it's going to run through Wednesday. We will not be having an adult service tonight. We'll not be having an adult service Wednesday, but please, please come Thursday. We're going to have the Pensacola Christian College um, Ensemble with us on Thursday, and I, I love every summer because we usually get two or three or four Christian colleges to come through and sing for us, and they're always a blessing. And I'll tell you this, you know, when Sometimes when people have a real negative view and they say, uh, there's Christianity, there's nothing left of it, then you see young people up here singing and praising uh, the Lord, you know, hey, there's hope, there's hope. And I want to tell you this, there's, there's always hope, there's always hope, don't ever let go of that. But that's going to be this Thursday, and again, tonight through Wednesday is VBS, um, and the biggest thing I want to tell you to do is just look at your, um, look at your uh, bulletin and we also have on there that next Sunday is brother Payne's birthday and what we want to ask you to do is if everybody could just bring a card with you next week um, we, we want to just flood him with birthday cards this coming Sunday and we're going to honor him during the service uh, but if you could do that and we also uh, want to mention I know none of you in here are aware of that but um, we we're not sure if we're going to technically live stream our services now all of our services are recorded and we will upload it later because every time there's a glitch in the internet the whole service has to start over and any of you who have had to watch online you're watching and going okay there were three songs and now it's all started over and it went out oh now it's back on but when we record it it's recorded completely just as uh, just as the service occurs so in the future uh, starting this morning and uh, and then in the future, we're going to not live stream, but we are going to record, and this service will be uploaded to our webpage, to YouTube, and to our Facebook page uh, later on today. And then in the future, evening service was, will probably be uploaded the next day. So that way you'll get to see the whole service um, in its entirety without me going, eh. Then we went at. And anyway, that, if, you, if you've never watched on live stream, that's what the live stream is like sometimes, okay? Uh, that's what it's like sometimes. We want to uh, also mention in prayer just very quickly on the back of the page, we've had a couple of surgeries this last week that both went well, Hubert Faust and Robert Bennett. Uh, Donna Greer's been diagnosed with vertigo. Dolores Shankles has a stress test coming up. And then we want, to, want you again to mention the Young family. We mentioned to you that... Uh, Many of them uh, had caught COVID, several of them had, and uh, Jenny's aunt, Lana, has COVID and is in ICU on a ventilator right now. Uh, doctors are having trouble getting her oxygen level up. Teresa, Jenny's mom, also has COVID, is in ICU, um, but she's doing a lot better. She does have pneumonia, but her breathing is improving. High oxygen flow and her lungs are clear. So they're very optimistic about that. And then Jenny also mentioned that she has a cousin 
who's also on the ventilator right now. And I've had people ask, are, you know, are we going, going to, to change anything? Um, and as of now, we're not. Um, even in our early service, uh, there was a time we required masks. We're not going to. But in our early service, we don't have nearly this, this many here. And we just we encourage people, if you're nervous about being around somebody, spread out. Because I know there's not as much room to spread out in here, but you're certainly welcome to wear masks in this service. You're certainly welcome to um, be away from people. I mean, I, I do see certain areas where you could sit a little bit away from people, and you're certainly welcome to do that. But at this point, we're not going to change anything as far as uh, uh, any of our policies with COVID. Um, it is, as you know, it is on the upswing a little bit, but it's uh, but the numbers I've seen. Um, Boy, when you compare them to just a few months ago, uh, right now, at least the last number I saw is there are less than 4,000 hospitalizations in Texas. And just a few months ago, there were 14,000 hospitalizations. So, you know, we hope it doesn't get any higher. We hope it stays where it is, and we're certainly uh, prayerful in, the, in, in that. Um, but we do want, you, don't, do want you to remember that. We also want to just take a moment and uh, recognize... Uh, the loose is this morning. I don't have the plaque with me, okay? So I'm not going to give you a plaque right now. But they just celebrated their 25th wedding anniversary. And we want to say congratulations. And uh, we'll, um, the, the, the place where we get the plaque is the place we've always gone. But post-COVID, they're only open three days a week instead of six days a week. Um, but uh, we should have it to you next week. But we do want to say congratu congratulations to uh, David and Laura and uh, 25 years more, all right? I've told you this, this, this before. There is a uh, comedian, and he said that uh, we need to change all the rules about uh, anniversaries. He said five years is now the bronze Ten years is gold, and fifteen years is Hall of Fame. <laughs> but uh, but we do want to say congratulations, and and I'll say this real quick, and let Brother Eddie get back up here. Um, you know, since I've been here, we have given away two seventy-year plaques. Now, everyone involved has since passed, but two seventy-year plaques. That just that's astounding. That's incredible, and I love I love giving away these plaques to people uh, who've been married a long time. God bless you, David and Laura, and uh, pray for again for many, many years to come. Brother Eddie. Thank you, Pastor. As you can see, this is supposed to be the big top. We are going to have the carnival theme for VBS. Uh, Matthew was just talking to me during fellowship time. We are still in need of volunteers. So when you bring your juice boxes, as I know all of you will this afternoon, uh, we need juice boxes and uh, other items, so as you come, we need our volunteers here by 530. Yes. I just need to tell you, he's going to do the same thing during this song that he did that pre-camp song, because people wouldn't give camp, and he's not going to stop singing until we have volunteers, okay? Amen. Amen. <laughs> okay, he's not really going to, he's not really going to do that, but we sure could use just a handful more. Thank you, Pastor. Uh filled and that means they were satisfied and the the biggest point i want to make to you and, I, and that i'm going to stress to you this morning folks is that jesus christ satisfies the longing that's in our heart and he does and here we're going to see him uh, filling a void and filling a physical void and the first thing we're going to look at is the dilemma in verses one through three Let's read that. It says, In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him and saith unto them, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away, fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the way, for divers, or many of them, came from far. Let's pray together. Fathers, we enter your pray it would open up our hearts to what you would have us hear, what you would have us think, what you would have us believe. 
And Father, we are grateful that you do satisfy the longing in our hearts. You satisfy everything that we try to fill in with the world. And yet you truly satisfy us. And we are grateful and thankful for that. And this morning we again want to remember these on our prayer list. We especially want to remember the several in the young family who have COVID. Lord, bless them and lift them up. We're thankful for these who have had surgery this last week and are feeling better. And again, Lord, just a whole list of people who, who are in need of your help physically, but more importantly, spiritually. And now, Lord, may our minds, just for these next few moments, be concentrated on you, and may we see what you would have for us in this passage. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the first thing I've mentioned here is the spiritual hunger. Here are people that had been with Jesus for three days listening to his teaching and preaching. And I saw somebody post on Facebook the other day about... Uh, how long revivals are today and how long they used to be. Um, if you have a three-day revival meeting in your church, you're pushing it, maybe four. And you talk to any, almost any evangelist today and see either Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, or Sunday through Wednesday. That's the times that they do revivals. But then uh, it used to be, and I, by the way, I'm not saying that the past was any better or any worse. It's, I'm just telling you the way it used to be. It used to be that a week was nothing. And sometimes they would extend it. They would have a week and the evangelist would say, I've talked to the pastor and we're going to do this two weeks. Um, many people don't realize that the, the crusade that made Billy Graham famous was only supposed to go on a few weeks and it went on for seven or eight weeks because they just kept going. Now I say that because that's even hard to think about today, isn't it? Anybody in here busy? I mean, we're all busy, aren't we? I know people who are retired who are more busy retired than they were when they were working. And boy, it's just, it's hard to say, hey folks, we're going to have a week's worth of meeting. We're going to have two weeks worth of meetings. Okay, folks, we're going to have a special guest who's going to be here only on Sunday night, all right? Can you do that? Um, but the fact is, they've been with Jesus for three days now. And it mentions how hungry they were. And they were spiritually hungry, first of all. And I want to mention that and ask the question, why were they spiritually hungry? And this is a verse that we mentioned last week in Mark 5.20. This is talking about the man who had been healed of being, of being demon-possessed. He had been running through a graveyard naked and cutting himself and screaming and attacking people. He got saved, and the Bible says he was clothed and seated and in his right mind. Well, he came to Jesus and said, let me follow you. And here's what Jesus said. No, you need to go witness to these people around you. And chapter 5, verse 20 says, And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. This one witness told hundreds about Jesus, thousands. And now we have thousands in the same area following him that just a few months before were telling Jesus to leave. They didn't want him around. They said, get out of here. And at that point, Jesus had one convert in Decapolis. Now, if you look at the numbers, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten thousand 10,000 people are now following Jesus because of one man. Brother Steve Haney and I were talking about that, that fact afterwards, and probably the, the place where you can see the difference in one man more than any is in wartime. There are so many stories about just one man who will stand up and fight while others are fleeing. And, of course, one person I think of automatically is Audie Murphy. And many know the famous story of him getting on the back of a burning tank and firing at the enemy and just doing that for a minute and two and ten and fifteen, twenty, thirty, while the rest of his men were behind him taking cover. And just as he jumped off the tank, it blew up. And he was responsible for literally saving scores of lives that day. One man, just one man. 
We mentioned, we've mentioned to you about King David when he was just the little shepherd boy. One man takes on Goliath and turns the whole course of that war. And just one man. And I want to stress to you now, one person through the power of Christ can make a difference. How much can you do through Christ, according to Paul? I can do what? All things through Christ which strengthens me. But the key is that last part. Christ is the one who strengthens us. And when we do it in His might and His power, there's no telling what we can do for the Lord. But notice now also, I want to look at the physical hunger. Because it does say, boy, these people are just hungry. They have been, they've been out here for three days. And the implication is here that there may have been some who haven't eaten for three days, which immediately shows to me that these people were not Baptist. Because I'm telling you, I see some of you already looking at that clock, and you're going, at 11.15, brother, you better be done, because we've got to beat the Methodist to Chili's, all right? We can't wait in that line ready to eat. I mean, these, these people were hungry. And some of them had... had apparently been hungry the whole time. You see, the crowd hungered spiritually so much that they had gone without food for three days. Some may have brought some provision, but by now, all the food had been eaten. And I was thinking about sermons that I've heard where I've just completely lost track of time. And I've been so enthralled listening to it that suddenly I look at my watch and I'm going, it's that late? Wow! Wow! Because you're just enthralled with, and these people for three days got to hear Jesus teach. Folks, I, I, I would love to just hear one hour of Jesus teaching. <laughs> they got to hear three full days. Boy, don't you know their spiritual cup was full, but now their physical cup needed to be full too. So we have the disciples. They come into the picture in verse 4. And his disciples answered him, From whence can a man satisfy these men with bread? here in the wilderness. And he asked them, how many loaves have ye? And they said, seven. So Jesus had called the disciples in and he didn't necessarily ask them what to do. He just said, folks, we've got to do something. Okay, we've got to do something. I mean, if I send them away, they're going to faint. Some of these people came from a long way away. We've, we've got to get a meal in them. You know, some people wonder today about is it more important to preach the gospel or what about what they you know, sometimes call the social gospel, helping people and things like that. And folks, I just, I honestly don't see a separation between the two. I mean, the Bible calls us to be a blessing to those around us. And some people just very narrowly say, no, oh, just, just preaching the gospel, that's all we need to do. And, and the fact is, there is a, another aspect of humanity that if somebody doesn't have food, folks, they're not going to come to your church service. Uh, when I was in Fiji a few years back, um, and, I, and I always stress this, it was a mission trip. When I say Fiji, people are going, what resort did you stay in? And I'm like, we didn't. <laughs> we stayed in homes and boring things like that, you know. But when we went to Fiji... There was one Sunday, and they split us all up, and I went to a missionary who was out among the Hindus. And he said that every service, he brings food to his service. It attracts people in. And he said, but you know what? We're way behind the Mormons. He said, they have tons of food at every service you go to there. Tons of food to give away to people. Because the people are hungry. And folks, I'm just telling you, if, if somebody's hungry physically, it's hard for them to concentrate on anything else. And so this, this particular missionary would bring food, and people would come, and hey, here's a, here's a bag of rice for you. Here's, sometimes they would have a few things cooked, but mainly it was rice they would have for the people who came to the service every single week. And the fact is, these, these people were hungry. But notice the disciples here. Where can we find all these loaves? What's your, be honest, what's your first thought when you hear the disciples go, where, can, where are we going to find all these loaves? I know what your first thought is. You're like, you dimwits. 
Were you not around just a few months ago when Jesus said the 5,000? And as the uh, one study Bible said, some find the disciples' question incredible in light of the earlier feeding of the 5,000, but it was consistent with their spiritual dullness and lack of understanding. But folks, lest we be hard on them, we're kind of spiritually dull too, and we actually have the Holy Spirit living within us. I mean, how many times does something... And our first, our first instinct is to panic. And yet we realize God saw me through the last time this happened. And he saw me through the, time, the last time it happened. And he saw me through the last time it happened. And I'm just going to say this. I don't know about you. God has a really good track record with me. I don't know about you, but his track record with me is outstanding. And yet still something will pop up and immediately I think, oh no, oh no. How, how are we going to get through this? What are we going to do? And then I say, oh, all these dull disciples, what's wrong with them? I want to say, we dull disciples, what's wrong with us? What's wrong with us? Are we not going to have faith in God? And you know that the definition of faith that I've just been quoting to you over and over after I read it about six or eight months ago, folks, faith is not belief without proof. It is trust without reservation. And when we get to the point that a situation comes up and we trust God without reservation, that's when we know we're moving forward in our faith. And by the way, if you think I'm preaching at you, I'm preaching at me first before I'm preaching at you. Or perhaps I'm preaching to you. But I preach to myself all the time. Believe me, I go through, I go through the whole week preaching to myself because I'm looking at things that these disciples did and I'm going, do I do any different? You remember the night of the Passover, and Peter says, I'll go to the death for you, Lord. And all the other disciples, so will we. You know, sometimes we jump on Peter, but did you know Peter did attempt to go to the death? What did he do in the Garden of Gethsemane? Folks, he pulled his sword. You know what he was going to do? He was going to fight these people to rescue Jesus. And he did chop off one guy's ear. And then Jesus said, put your sword away. And then I think at that point he put the sword away. He started counting. Let me see, there's 12 of us. There's 500 of them. See ya. But Peter at least did pull out his sword. I mean, I, I really believe he was going to die for the Lord right there. But see, what Peter wanted was not what Christ wanted. Christ looked at Peter and said, Peter, uh-uh, you're going to be a solid foundation in the early church. I'm going to need you to do great things for God in that early church. Put your sword away. It's not time for you to die yet. You will die for me, but not right now. Then, last, then third, I want you to look at the direction in verses 6 and 7. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground... And he took the seven loaves and gave thanks and break and gave to his disciples to set before them. And they did set them before the people. And they had a few small fishes and he blessed and commanded to set them also before them. Now this miracle is a little different. This one, the bread and the fish are at different times. Notice he gets the bread, blesses it, breaks it all up. Everybody gets full. He, the, the disciples all get back and one of them says, hey, there's also a few small fishes here. Okay, Lord bless these fish. Tears them up, boom. It spreads. What, see, what happened on this one was Jesus gave them an appetizer first before the main course, all right? The appetizer was the bread. You go, to, you go to Susanna's. Do you want bread today? And I want to tell you this, and I mean this sincerely, and it breaks my heart. I have been saying no to that question for two years at Susanna's. But anyway, um, but Jesus, Jesus gave them a, an appetizer, the bread, and then, boy, they're thinking, boy, this is good. Hey, fish. We get fish, too. And I love when it says Jesus gave thanks. Folks, the Lord just gave thanks for all of this. And you'll see Jesus constantly giving thanks when he's around food. And you know, I was thinking about this. Probably a meal over food, and I'm going to make it real tough for those of you who have to pray over your meal today at lunch. But the meal over food is probably the most rote prayer that we pray. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for the food. Woohoo! Let's eat. And yet when Jesus prayed over food, you don't get the feeling that he's just doing this road. It's, Lord, thank you. Bless this food. Bless this food. I'm going to make sure my wife prays at lunch today, by the way. Um, 
You know, Colossians 3.17 says this, And whatsoever you do, in word or deed, Folks, whatever you do, if you're doing something with your hands, if you're doing something with, you, with your mouth, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. And Paul was talking about food and giving thanks in 1 Timothy 4. And by the way, this is, this is uh, um, talking about the end times. And he says, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. That's those vegetarians, folks. But by the way... Scripture doesn't say it's wrong not to eat meat, but here are people who are commanding you. You can't have this. You can't have this. And here's what God says, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them, which believe and know the truth. For every creature in the next verse is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Folks, listen, if you've got bacon in front of you, give thanks. Receive it the right way. If you've got a vegetable salad, give thanks. Receive it the right way. But I'm just telling you this. I love reading this because this tells me that when I eat my meat, it's okay. It is okay when I eat my meat as long as I do it with thanksgiving. Now, when it does say nothing to be refused, I have to admit I've never eaten roadkill. But I do know, I do know people who will go find roadkill and cook it up and eat it. All right? I've known people who will eat squirrel. Um, I'm not going to go any further with this because we need to move on with the message. But here's the bottom line. Whatever's before you at lunch today, be thankful for it. Be th bless God for Thank you, Lord, for this. Whatever you're eating. Cow, chicken, pig. Thank you for this tomato, for this leaf of lettuce. Whatever you're eating, be thankful for it. And that's the way Jesus was. I want you to look at the light now in verses 8 and 9, so they did eat and were filled. And they took up the broken meat that was left seven baskets, and they that had eaten were about 4,000, and he sent them away. Oh, folks, it's, it's done. Everybody's doing great now. Everybody ate. Everybody's filled. But I want to mention something really important about when it says seven baskets. This word is a different word for the basket in the first one. The first basket is the kind that you would go to Hobby Lobby and buy a little old basket that, you know, you put on the corner. This basket is talking about a gigantic basket. In fact, here's the way the Nelson Study Bible worded it. These baskets were much larger than the 12 small personal baskets mentioned in 643. It was the kind of larger basket that was used to lower Paul over the wall of Damascus. So these baskets were large enough to put a grown man in and drop him down over a wall. And so this, these, this leftovers, they were this big. They were huge, big old baskets. And folks, it's amazing when you look at this because it says everybody was filled. Everybody was satisfied, and yet they're still leftover. And can I just tell you this, folks? When we truly live for Christ, we can be completely filled, and they're still leftover. Anybody ever heard the song, Drinking from My Saucer Because My Cup Overflowed? I mean, that's the idea behind this. I mean, God is just so abundantly given to these people that when it's all over, they're just like, and look how much we have left over. And I know you know this, folks. We can, we can never, we can never even stretch the riches of God. We can't even, we can't even stretch it. Because God owns it all. Everything is his. The last thing, let's look at the departure. And straightway, he had en entered into a ship with his disciples and came into the parts of Dalmanutha. So now, as soon as it's over, they had their big fellowship supper, they immediately get in and they sail back across. And you think about this, they've got 12 baskets. So now they've got food for several days. Left over from this big meal and they're ready to serve the Lord. Well, I want to get to a few final thoughts um, I always like to end my messages with uh, practical application for us. And the first thing is this. The disciples' cluelessness is only outdone by our own. And I'll say it again. You know, we, we, we say that we believe God is the Almighty and we believe that God can do anything but fail. By the way, that doesn't mean that God is going to do what we want Him to do. Okay? Let's understand that. But folks... If God really is the omnipotent, we need to have the thought that he can do whatever he desires to do. He can do it all. With God, all things are possible. 
And there's another verse that says, with God, nothing shall be impossible. And that doesn't mean there are impossible things. It just means this. When God sees something that's impossible, he can make it possible. God can do things that we can't even imagine. He can do over and abundant above all that we ask or even think. That's the God that we serve. Listen, don't limit what God can do. I know probably everybody in here is familiar with the song, I Can Only Imagine. And just uh, about three years ago, they made a movie explaining how it was written. And it's a fascinating movie. You would just never guess that that was the story behind that song. But the story was this. Bart Millard, who wrote it, had an extremely abusive father that would beat him and his mother regularly. And he got to the point in his music career that he, that he was told by his manager, look, something's missing here. Something's missing. And he admits, he said, my, my father's a monster. He said, well, then you've got to deal with that. And he goes home and through a series of events, he and his father make up. And in another part in the movie, he, he said, God took this man that was a monster and turned him into the man I wanted to be. But then he said, I forgot God could do that. You know what we do sometimes, folks? We forget that God can do things like that. We look at people and we say, well, there's no hope for them. Let's write them off. Uh Uh-uh. Never again. No, that person's not going to do anything for the Lord. You just never know what someone's going to do for the Lord. You never know when the next one of these kids that you see in here for VBS screaming and yelling that you think, what are those crazy kids doing? You never know which one of them God's going to call to to make a difference in this world. God may look at one of our young ladies and say, you know what? I'm not going to call you to a traditional, because usually we think pastors, missionaries, Christian school teachers. You know what? (laughs) We've got young people out of this church that are in the medical field. God calls them there. We've got people out of this church that are in the teaching field. God calls them there. I'll tell you, if there's anything we need in public schools, it's Christian teachers today. It's Christian teachers. But I'm just saying this, folks. We look at people and we see a little boy named David and God looks at him and sees a giant killer who's going to be king one day. Listen, let's not be clueless about that. Let's understand God can do what he wants with whomever he wants. And be careful about writing somebody off. By the way, Jesus did not write Judas Iscariot off until they were just about to take the Lord's Supper. And it says the devil entered into Judas. And that was when Jesus said, go. Not until the last moment did did Christ even write Judas Iscariot off. Here's the second thing. I am grateful for the patience and long-suffering of the Lord. Why do I say that? Because, folks, if I had been Jesus about a year into this thing with the disciples, I would have had another all-night prayer meeting and picked 12 different men. These guys, you just read it, they're just clueless. You think, they're going to get it, they're finally going to get it, and they don't. But I want to tell you, God is patient and long-suffering with us. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is not even a complete sentence. Jonah 3, 1, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, You say, what's the point? Because God came the second time. Jonah blew it the first time. God came to him the first time and said, Go to Nineveh. And he said, Let me see, Nineveh's that way? Okay, God. And he just went in the opposite direction. But folks... God had to teach him a big lesson. I don't know about you, I've, I've spent very little time inside a fish. Um, he did. He spent time inside of a fish, a big one. And while he was in there, it says he prayed to God. And the, the whale spit him up, and suddenly he's like, Lord, I'm ready to go to Nineveh. He still wasn't the perfect prophet, by the way, because he actually got mad that they repented. Nineveh had a great revival, many got saved, and Jonah was mad about it because Nineveh was Israel's enemies. And he still got mad. But you know what? 
The word of the Lord came into him a second time. And folks, I think if this verse was written about me, it would say, and the word of the Lord came under Brooks the 432nd time. Because God still deals with us. God still deals with us. Folks, even when we let him down, God still loves us and he still deals with us. And I can't imagine how many times I have let him down. And yet he still looks at me and says, I love you. I still got things for you to do. Here's the next thing I want to mention. Sometimes God's people don't speak for God. And sometimes that's hard to write because one of the most common complaints among people who are without Christ is that, well, I hear all these Christians, they're just doing this and this all the time. All they're doing is condemning. And I will tell you, there are some Christians that do that. I mean, they spend their whole time with their finger out. And some of them have even got it down to a machine gun. They can just go and wipe all of you out in one, one shot. But here was Jesus, listen, in Gentile territory. And by the way, he's been in Gentile territory now for several months. But if you ask the Jewish religious leaders of his day, where should you be, Jesus? They'd say, oh, he's got to be near around Jerusalem. I mean, he can, I guess he can go up through Samaria and into Galilee and a little bit on the other side of the Jordan River, but that's where he needs to be. That's where God's people are. And instead, he goes over to Gentile territory. The journey of Jesus to Tyre, Sidon, and the Decapolis proves that although Gentiles are ostracized by Jews, they're not ostracized by God. Jewish invective against Gentiles does not reflect a divine invective. Have you ever heard people say, oh, those people can't be saved? We shouldn't even talk to people like that. They're just too far gone. Folks, I want to tell you this. Until somebody's in a casket, they're not too far gone. The grace of God can reach down to people even in the last moments of their life. I've seen it personally. When I was in Jacksonville, there were some people in my church that watch an elderly man, and they said he wants to talk to you. And I went and talked to a 93-year-old man. He could barely talk, and most of his answers were by shaking his hand. And I shared the plan of salvation with him. And he, he, he said, yes. Just barely, and a little tear flow, flowed out of his eye, and the next day he died. Folks, you never know what God can do. And rather than pointing at people and saying, well, those people can't be saved, folks, pick your group. But they're gay. They can't be saved. Really? Is that what God's Word said, or is, or is that what you say? Those people are illegal immigrants. They can't be saved. Now, is that what you're saying or is that what God's saying? Now, folks, I'm not getting into, into my political positions right now. I'm just telling you the fact of the matter. When we look at anybody, especially a whole group, and say, God can't even mess with them. Folks, I know of Muslims who are being saved today. And if I can get you something to pray about, I'm praying that during revival month this year, we can get a converted Muslim to preach here. Oh, Muslims can't be saved. They're all godless. They're all just trying to kill everybody. Folks, God can save who he wants to save. Now, I will admit, when you get into the area of politics, that's where it gets a little bit difficult. But I think God can even save politicians, folks. I really do. Now, some of y'all are looking at me like, you just went too far, Brother Mark. You just went too far. I could accept every other group you mentioned, but not politicians. Folks, God can even save politicians. Proverbs 21 says that the heart of the king is in his hands, and he can turn it whithersoever he will. Here's another thing. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And this goes along with what I was saying, who Jesus was ministering to. He was ministering to Gentiles here. And John the Baptist didn't say, Behold the Lamb of the God that takes away the sins of Jerusalem, that takes away the sins of Israelites. He said that takes away the sins of the world. Here is Jesus winning Gentiles to Christ. We don't have to wait till Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 for Gentiles to get saved. They were saved here. They were saved when the Samaritans got saved. They were saved in the Old Testament when Nineveh got saved. 
They were saved all the way throughout the Old Testament. Anybody ever heard of Rahab and Ruth? Gentiles. And yet they're in the line of Jesus Christ. Let's not box off God and say, this is who God saves. Folks, I want to tell you, this is who God saves. <laughs> this is who God saves. And again, one commentator said, Jesus is not simply a redeemer, a Messiah like Moses and David. He is the redeemer, offering redemption to more than just the people of Israel. And I'm going to finish with my last point here. Folks, only Jesus can truly satisfy the human soul. These people finished and they were filled. One philosopher from the past said this, There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person which cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God the Creator. Acts 17, 28 says, For in Him we live and move and have our being. Everything that we do is wrapped up in who God is. Ephesians 1, 3, Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with how many spiritual blessings? Say it. How many? All spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. And that's why I don't believe there's any type of a second gift of the Holy Spirit or anything like that. Folks, when we get the Holy Spirit, we get it all. We get it all. And we get it at the moment of salvation. That's when we get the Holy Spirit. And we've got it all. The problem is not with how much spirit we have. It's with how much pride we have. The Spirit wants to fill us and control us. But we say, you know what? I got my own ideas. But folks, God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Not just blessings, but James 1.17. Every good and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. Folks, how many, let me ask you again, how many, or how many gifts that are good and perfect come down from God? Every one of them. All of them. Think of something good in your life right now. It's from God. Think of something good in your life. It's from God. You say, I love my family. Bless God for it. Praise God for it. Love the job that I have. Praise God for it. I love the people I'm around. Praise God for it. Folks, praise God for the blessings that you have. Because as the song that, that, that we rarely sing, but it's, it's probably one of the oldest hymns in our hymnal, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Everything, every good, and every perfect gift comes down from God. Listen, don't ever forget, folks, it's only Jesus who can truly satisfy your soul. And that satisfaction cannot happen unless you're saved. And as we put up every week, if there's someone who is lost here, we want you to understand how to get to heaven, how to have Jesus satisfy your soul. And first, you've got to recognize who you are and who Christ is. We're sinful Christ is perfect, the Son of God who died for our sins and rose from the dead. We've got to repent. And I, I use this verse almost every week, but it's one of my favorites in the book of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, where Paul says, you turned from your idols to worship and serve the living God. That's what God wants you to do. Turn from your idols and turn to Him. You've got to receive Christ as Savior. It's just simply by believing and asking Him. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe when you that He died on the cross to take your sins away, and He rose from the dead to prove who He was, and that He had the power to take your sins away, and you truly trust in that, instead of whatever else you're trusting to get to heaven, you will be saved. And if you ever know what you're trusting to get to heaven, just ask yourself this. If God asked me, why should I let you into heaven, how would you answer? And folks, some are going to get up there and say, I'm a good guy. I've done many wonderful works in your name. And the Lord's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. But some are going to come up and say, I'm not even worthy to be in this place. But your precious son gave his life for my sins on the cross. And he rose from the dead. That's why. That's why. Heaven is my home. And I heard a preacher on YouTube this last week. And he said, can you imagine what happened when the thief on the cross 
got to the gate of heaven. And he said, in our minds, we would say, give us the four areas of theology that Paul wrote with the book of Romans. And he said, if we asked all these different questions of, of that thief who had been on the cross, here's his answer. Well, the guy who was on the cross in the middle told me I could come in. That's what he had answered. And folks, you know why I'm going to heaven? Because the guy on the cross in the middle told me I can. When I trust him as my Savior. And if you've never done that, I hope you'll do that today. Let's stand at this time, please, and have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the satisfaction that you bring to us. Your satisfaction never promises that we will not have difficulties and hardships, but it does promise that during anything that we face, we can remember that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And right now, Lord, we ask you to bless this invitation time. If there's someone here who, who's never trusted you, Maybe they understand how it's done now. Maybe, maybe they know that, that they have to realize they're a sinner and that Jesus died for them and rose from the dead. Maybe they realize that for the first time. Lord, help them to understand it's just as simple as asking. Just as simple as, as saying, Father, forgive me. I know I'm a sinner, but I know you died for me. Lord, if there are Christians who are struggling right now, and in many ways we all are, help us to remember these applications, and especially the final one that only Jesus can satisfy. There's so much out there for us to grab onto rather than Jesus.